Alright, on to Chariots of Fire. This is uh, Great Battles of History. I think this is the newest of this series. I'm not absolutely certain. Certainly the earliest period in this series. Uh, Samurai is fairly recent. I already covered that. That may be actually newer. Uh, Alright, anyway. One picks up a series game like this, largely because, hey, familiarity is going to kind of help me understand. Yeah, I understand. This is huge, you know, differences of time, and this particular period is just, you know, so far back that you know, we're talking pre-classical here by a lot, actually. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about the very dawn of civilization and, and military formations from what the author, in this case, it's as far as I can tell, yeah. first reading through it and then looking at the credits when they came out. This is primarily Berg taking designing this game. Um, I don't think Herman was involved in this except in terms of inspiring the initial system essentially. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> they've really outdone themselves or, uh, in terms of avoiding that system in a lot of ways. Even in some cases where I think it was a little gratuitous and I'm pretty opposed to that in spirit at least. So. Let's look at what you get, kind of. Pretty common looking counters across the board. Look like your SPQR ones. You got these little things. Hey, what are they? Engaged? Moved? Wait, what about the units? Don't they say moved? No, they don't. Uh, they actually, the reverse side is being used to indicate um, something else. I'm <laughs> um, not entirely sure what anymore. Uh, I guess we'll get to it when I look at the rules. I remember looking and thinking, well, that's kind of odd, but it serves a purpose. You got some new things, a turn marker. What's up with that? Well, apparently some of the scenarios need it. These little route point tracking markers, although they're not uh, very clear. I had to kind of say, ooh, what are those bubbles? How many? Why so many? Well, each army has its own little route track. You got this little tracking chart, keeps track of game turn and route points. I probably don't really need it. You can keep track of the route points on paper like I did with SPQR or other games. Um, you also have, of course, and this isn't all the counters. I've got more in here. A uh, bunch of counters uh, for each nationality. Some are serving dual purpose. So, for example, in the first scenario, uh, I don't know who it is. It's Sumer versus Acadia. Yeah. And... They're both using another power's color and largely another power's units. They have a couple of special units because that's just so far back uh, that, you know, real chariots don't even exist. And chariots are really the focus of this system. But uh, you got your uh, rule book and your playbook. Playbook, I think, is almost entirely devoted to scenarios. Let's see. Yeah. Um, they had kind of a, an issue in terms of the playbooks rather thick. I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily, but it's not filled with lots and lots of scenarios so much as it covers also the simple Great Battle of History rules for this, which probably have to be completely rewritten for this game, and uh, scenario modifiers for that. Um, you also have sets of charts. I've got a couple of the basic game charts here, the standard game. Those are repeated, so each player has two sets of charts. Now, much, much bigger typeface. There are positives and negatives to that, but overall I think it's for the plus. Um, but you got like two little booklets of charts, essentially. Not terribly sturdy material, but you're getting a lot of stuff, and yeah, it's better than paper. Um, and then you also have two sets of simple Great Battles of History charts for the game to handle that simpler version. Now, I'm not even going to worry about the simple version. Uh, 
Although maybe I should have, given my feelings so far about the roles, but I tend to like the finickiness of uh, the standard great battles of history. But now, when we start getting to the divergences, some of them, like the large span of chariot rolls, very, very clearly are a matter of handling uh, the design you know, and, and, and the particular subject matter, trying to fit it to this. And there's some significant differences. You don't have really formed units in, in the sense that you do in the classical era, for example. At least that's the designer's view. And I think it's probably fairly reasonable, seeing as once really formed units and, and real military machines start appearing on the scene, they just overwhelm everyone. But there may be other factors involved in that, and maybe uh, the troops actually did have better formation than it's assumed. There's no way of knowing. You know, uh, the, ski the historical information on this period is minimal. <laughs> you know, a carving on a stele, and maybe some other archaeological evidence, like what the weapons kind of were like in a couple of cases. Chariots, for example, they found uh, examples of, and, and you know. But you're really kind of working entirely on guesswork and maybe, you know, a mention of a battle, but almost nothing said about it, nothing believable. Um, so this is really largely a hypothetical game. Uh, these battles, it's more a matter of do they give a feel that's believable than do they, in the same way that a fantasy game would. And I don't see that as a problem. Uh, I want to play these battles out. I want to explore this, uh, in this case, uh, Richard Berg's view of what these battles were like, uh, taken from historical analysis from others, and then, you know, himself making decisions on what the, uh, you know, the problems involved in it are, and then trying to give numbers and stuff. And numbers is one of the issues. Uh, one thing... I don't really want to go too much into the counters, but if we look at a, a, a unit counter, it no longer has a number, a, a, a size factor on it. Uh, it was just decided, you know, we have no idea. <laughs> uh, relative size, each counter is about the same, so more or less. And um, so that's factored in, and it makes it easier, but whatever. Um, there are some things that do not turn out so easily though. And let us... First of all, lots of different types of units. In the first scenario we're going to have these battle wagons instead of chariots, but a significant amount of the rules has to do with how chariots are used. It is a game about the chariot era, essentially. The chariots are the kings of the battlefield here, and one of the arguments of why there couldn't be formed units is chariots worked. <laughs> you know, uh, once you start seeing formed uh, units that are that have some, uh, I don't know, can resilience to being attacked without turning into a mob. Once you start seeing cavalry, which there very clearly was not, well. No, not very clearly. It seems very unlikely that there was armed, mounted men fighting. Uh, there's no indication of it. So, once you start seeing those things, the chariots kind of fade away. They're just too fragile. Uh, they have to deal with almost purely flat terrain. And you see them in the classical games, and they suck. And that is a reason. They, you could still feel them, but they just didn't serve the purpose they did before. And, well, you got different movement charts based on the different types of unit. Infantry basically have one, wheeled units have the other. Uh, what you'd be kind of used to, this chart, but it's been reworked. And apparently this is the first game it's been reworked in. Uh, shock superiority, well, that's your standard cross-reference one weapon type versus another. Uh, see if one side has the superiority, and likewise Clash of Arms gives you the base table that you're going to be uh, rolling on, just like you do in the other GBOH games. Here you got something new, which is that armor is different enough. Now you could say skirmishers, for example, have much lighter armor than, you know, hoplites would. 
so I'm not I'm not sure how much that's not a factor but here they decided to really distinguish between um, the more armored units and the less armored units even though probably the difference is greater in the later era the armor is better um, I'm not sure why that choice was made perhaps one of those gratuitous choices uh, missile range You've got different kinds of missile weapons here, and you've got a distinguishment between the two bows, the composite and the self bow. Uh, one has to assume these are fairly uh, ineffective composite bows, not the Mongol bow, certainly, but uh, then that kind of leads you to wonder, well, what are they using in the classical era? Because uh, in a lot of cases, I think people were, there were mixes of weapons at that point too, and they're all treated as bows there. So again, it's kind of this, eh, let's give it a little, but I don't think that's a big deal. You see this heroic combat, that a little reminiscent of samurai here, in fact, very similar system, although you don't have to commit suicide if you refuse a challenge. Um, there's no samurai code here. Okay. Base sequence of play looks similar. Uh, initiative determination, okay, that sounds a little, you know, you look at, but it doesn't work the same in this game. The activation doesn't work the same in this game. Orders, lots and lots of differences here, at least to my memory. Maybe I totally don't understand uh, my SPQR when I played it, and I played a lot of it without understanding if that's the case, but... I'm finding a lot of things where I said, whoa, that's not how that worked. Uh, and there's, in, in a lot of places, there are notes that say, look, this isn't what it is. But in other places, I'm seeing no such notes, and I'm kind of like, whoa, I either have to look my SPQR up, or I'll just have this as an ongoing question. Um, I'm not going to go into a detailed comparison of what's different here and what's not. But there is at least one huge difference, and then things to handle the era more. Uh, and then you got kind of your maintenance phase down at the bottom after that. And at the end of each turn, you count to see, hey, did I run away from the field? Okay. Leaders here, well, uh, we got a command. So leadership in this game is a little different from some of the others, which is that you have an overall commander. Okay, you often have that. But he's significant more um, for sort of what seems almost like a civil war battle type of command structure in the sense that his wings have to be in range of him to do things, to act. And he may also have his own unit, and in the first scenario he will, and no wings uh, as well. Then he also has an initiative rating, which is going to affect that initiative phase. You basically just roll off and see who gets that. Now, what's weird here is this game, for whatever reason, there's the decision, hey, let's use a chip pull system here instead of, you know, the normal kind of pulsed system. Um, terribly different? No. But that was kind of the first real blow towards, wow, what the hell is going on here? Because uh, to me, that's not great battles of history anymore. I mean, once you start changing things that fundamentally. Now, there's a lot that looks like it. There's no question there. But there's a significant amount that doesn't. And ah, I don't know. You know, I mean, you buy us into a system because you like what the system stands for. Um, I'm not opposed to chip pull. Uh, it may be better for this, but it's a new mechanism that has to be learned for this system that has to be rewritten and redone, and there could be new mistakes entered into it, as well as my own. Okay, so because it's chip pull, what you're going to have is these little activation markers, and you essentially have two. You have basic, well, you have one per unit, or command, essentially. And then you have this momentum marker, which is probably added in every battle. And that allows your head commander to kind of make, I believe, a roll to see if he gets an additional momentum. So what you don't get is the kind of battles that you saw that I thought was kind of a chaotic feature uh, of 
Oh look, one side of the battle is just devolve, is developing very, very rapidly. You know, the good commanders are moving and they're getting momentum and momentum. You don't see that. What you see actually is a leader playing one action and then maybe getting the momentum off of uh, the momentum chip when it comes into play. And let's see how that actually works if it's here. When the momentum marker, you designate a wing or division that you try to use, uh, possibly a second time, or possibly before its actual AM appears. In order to do this, you have to be in command of your overall commander, or be the overall commander, and you roll a die. And you have to roll um, lower or equal to the capability rating, which is sort of like the initiative rating for the lesser raider leaders. Let's see what we got here. Um, capability is in the same position as initiative there. If it's the overall commander, you can use his initiative for that, I believe. Um, well, you better. Uh, and if you fail, it doesn't happen. You draw another chip and see who goes next. <laughs> um, there's also a trumping concept in here, like in most great battles of history games. In this, you have the option to try to cancel the activation marker and use your own, one of your own uh, commands. And you get one of these per game turn. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any trump used or anything like that markers in here, which changes the nature of you know, the overall game, it's not like each unit has a chance to jump in and do something. You have one shot in the entire turn. And if you succeed on your overall commander's initiative rating, uh, the activation marker just drawn is set aside and not used. And the trumping player gets to you pick one of his wings to do something kind of for free. And it doesn't look like it has any cost. Um, but if you fail, then the opposing player gets to put his momentum marker back in the pool if he's already used it, or to put it back in when he draws it after using it. Uh, so there's a, a penalty to failure, but a good commander can trump in without too much risk here. It's not as bad as an SPQR, at, at the very least. I don't remember Samurai too well. I know it had a different system as well. Who, who wrote Samurai? I don't know. Is that a different... Yeah, I got Berg and Herman on there. and That's the same as this box. But then when we get to the actual... Uh, so that may have also been a, a, a generally a Berg design because there's similarities in some ways. Um, okay. Now, in orders here, you don't have your li line orders. You order your command, and that is like Samurai. Uh, your command has to kind of be in range of you in order to do stuff. And now what's weird here, is this the one? No. I was clipping uh, Chandra Gupta is different too. It seems to have... I don't even want to go into that. I haven't looked at the rules for that. Uh, that that's the next one I was planning on doing out of the series. Um, okay. So, uh, you've got to trace your, your command range, and then you have a choice between rallying, and that is just an action for your whole command. If you rally... Uh, uh, I think it's a different thing. They rally any and all eligible units, whether... Yeah, rally is something you do relating to your command flag. We'll get to that in a little bit. But instead of taking a command that you're due, you can choose to rally with your, your overall commander. But if you don't do that, you can do kind of the normal things with your units. And each unit that's in command can uh, move and or fire, recover uh, quality hits, or the entire command can attempt to disengage if it's engaged. Now remember, we got these little markers, these extra markers, they say engaged on them. This is, I think, a clever advance in the system. Um, and we'll see how it works when we get to the combat. But 
it's one of those very different things and I, I feel like it belongs in all of them unfortunately I don't think it's gonna go in all of them okay um, now what are these little moved markers those moved markers are to indicate uh, what used to be done when you flip the counter a unit can only move once in any given orders phase and you mark it that way okay that's no big deal but the units that move get these moved markers so that when they if they move in another orders phase they take their cohesion hits just like in um, SBQR um, and no I don't know Alexander it's been so long since I played that uh, you know 20 years um, okay and anything exciting about movement well there sort of is facing changes this is one of those wow this is very different I think um, facing changes are a little bit more restrained in this in some ways um, than I remember them being well maybe less restrained actually because I think in SPQR you can't make facing changes when you're in a zone but here you sort of can uh, and, and we'll see that maybe terrain there isn't going to be much you have rules for column movement but essentially I think units will be entering in column I don't know if there's a uh, even rules for un for putting things into column um, Oh yeah, let's let's take a look at the different unit types just briefly, because they are kind of interesting. We have these barbarian infantry who look like they're the heaviest stuff in the game, actually, kind of the strongest infantry units. We have the battle wagons and the chariots. Then we have heavy infantry, uh, which I think is sort of the barbarian infantry beginning to become formed units. Light missile infantry that'll be pretty similar to what we have in uh, other great, great battles of history. Runner infantry, these are special kind of uh, like commanded muskets. <laughs> they run along with the chariots alongside and can help strengthen a chariot's shock ability. And then we have shock infantry, which seems to be kind of conscript spearmen largely or whatever. Um, kind of low quality, it appears. And as normal, you have uh, a quality value and then a, a, a movement allowance. No other numbers on these. Well, and then for missile uh, things, you have a little missile indicator. You might have a name of the type. You have a unit that it belongs to for command. All right. Let's see. Where are we? Let's go back. We got orderly withdrawal rules here. These seem significantly different. Um... You don't automatically orderly withdraw. You have to make a roll against your tactical quality. You have to be faster. And then you can pull back. And that roll may incur a hit on you on a failure. And there's also automatic hits um, from being approached from a rear flank heck side, as in SPQR. There's no cav, so, and the chariots don't seem to have an advantage here other than being able to move quickly enough to do it against Muth's things. Um, stacking, one unit per hex in general. Uh, the one exception to that is those runner infantry who can stack with a particular type of chariot, which I think you have those chariots if you have runner infantry. Uh, Facing pretty much normal, um, except for refacing. The refacing changes. Um, you pay a movement point for each vertex shifted, kind of like light infantry would. No Roman specials here. Uh, chariots can do this, but they can only reface two hex sides before moving another hex because they have trouble with their turn radiuses. Uh, BWs are similar, battle wagons are slow chariots basically, they are even more restricted. Um, you can't change facing after moving into an enemy unit's front hex. Now this is all I think clearer than SPQR's rules were, uh, but if you advance after combat you can change one vertex. If you begin your movement in missile uh, fire combat in a front hex of a single enemy unit, 
you can use half your movement allowance in facing changes. We're up to it. Uh, if you do so, you can't use missile fire and you can't conduct shock combat. Now this is very different. In great battles of history, you have trouble getting out of the enemy zone of control. There aren't zones of control here. There's something a little weaker. Um, and then uh, terrain effects, you can take uh, you take hits to your formation for moving through terrain, just like in, in the other games, and for changing facing in, form, in uh, terrain, which I'm not sure that applies. I don't remember. There's so little, so few of the battles are in terrain that causes a lot of troubles. All right. Let us split vids, and we'll get to some of the special rules in the combat. All right. Well, what about chariots? So, lots of special rules for chariots, basically. But, let's look at some of the major ones here. Chariot pass-through. Basically, any chariot or chariot plus runner infantry can run through a unit. Maybe. <laughs> uh, there's additional rules further on about stopping them as they run through somewhere. I don't know where it is. But essentially you can pass through another unit but only through another chariot unit. Ah, here it is. Uh, and if it's a chariot unit with runner infantry they might be able to prevent you and essentially you make a roll against tactical quality and you might block them and I don't think they're forced I don't know combat is uh, see the sh who has to attack and who doesn't felt a little different to me too so I'm not sure if you have to attack in that case I think so but maybe not because light infantry archers wouldn't um, and if you fail your, your tactical quality check as the blocker then they can run through and the main reason, well, first of all, you have to have enough movement points to actually pass through. You can conceivably turn around and hit the line again. Uh, and in fact, there's a note that indications seem to be that that's what was done, but it's really kind of weird to look at. Now, the designer has taken the thought that chariots are mainly being used as firing platforms. Uh, I see another possibility for them. So there's also the, they could be shock platforms, but he makes this argument of, well, they wouldn't work well. You can't really fight from them as a platform. I see a different, uh, almost a Dragoon type option here, where you would be running through and drop troops off as you fire through who we're going to engage. Now, obviously in the two-person chariots that wouldn't happen, but in the three-person it might. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, the truth is, we just don't know. I, so now, let's see. Yeah, you can pass through multiple hexes of enemy chariots. And so the idea here is, as you ride by, you get to fire at them at exceedingly close range. And... There is indeed a pass-through column, which is even more bloody for the composite bows than at one hex. That's where you'd want to get to attack. There's also this chariot turnover optional rule, which we're going to try to use here. I don't understand it fully. No big shock. You know, I kind of learn these things as I'm going. Somewhere there should be a chariot turnover chart over here and basically you have to declare how many movement points you're going to use and then each time you turn in that uh, se sequence you have to roll and there's a possibility that you take a tactical quality hit indicating that some of your chariots have flipped over and you know it's going to be a problem um, okay and we haven't hit the other one okay missile fire doesn't look too terribly different. You can move and fire at the same time. Well, 
<laughs> you can fire while moving or otherwise and somewhere or another. There's more charts for this, but some of them are just to make things easier. However, you do end up flipping through a lot. Looking for, what am I looking for? I'm looking for ah, missile range and results. It's going to give me the die roll modifier. So, for example, hmm, doesn't look like moving. Oh, yeah, here we go. Plus one if light infantry with certain missile types move and, and fire in the same phase. Slight penalty. And that can be a big deal. I mean, you don't have many chances of hitting. Uh, one interesting thing here is you can cause multiple hits with the missile fire. But note, you have to take into account the target's armor, which may provide a penalty to your chance of hitting. Hmm? Okay. Uh, looks like slingers are... No, just about anything is good at hitting the light infantry, the, the lightly armored infantry. Everything else is considered to be a little bit heavier armored. Okay. Uh... There's actually some line of sight rules, and in this, and this is new to me, I don't remember this in SPQR, you can fire over a unit. Makes sense, but again, it's not mentioned, noted in any sense, although other things in the game, many other places, it says, oh, this is a significant departure. Well, I don't remember this being possible. Maybe I'm just missing something. Okay. Um, and it doesn't look like there's a, a significant effect to that unless you're firing down at a target at great range. And I'm not sure where the range on, tar on missile weapons is uh, specified. Certainly isn't infinite. Missile range and results table. Hmm. Ah, here's the range. Okay. Um, all right, what do we got here? Chariot, fire, and run. Okay, so this is an idea where you stand back, you have a chariot near the enemy, and you choose to basically charge in and go back to your starting hex. And there's restrictions on this. Uh, you must be within three hexes, but not adjacent to the target. You trace uh, a path. And it can be through uh, friendly <coughs> occupied hexes, any non-rough hex, and across streams as long as they're not ugly. But you'll take cohesion penalties. And it's just sort of notionally moved up there. The defender gets a defense of fire, and then the attacker gets a fire. And I believe the attacker and defender fire are both at one hex on this. Um, and then chariot pass through fire is also covered here. Here, the reaction unit gets fire at one hex if they if they have uh, uh, missile weapons. Okay, so we've got reaction fire, which allows you uh, to either fire when somebody moves adjacent to you, or if you fire at them. Now, this is beginning to be written. Uh, no, non-phasing player cannot use entry and return fire against the same unit. It, it, it's beginning to sound more and more like Men of Iron's system here with the way it's worded, except for that proviso. I'm not sure if that is in Men of Iron, but I remember marching up, taking fire, fire, getting return fire, and that being a really ugly situation in Men of Iron. That doesn't seem to be the case here. Maybe I was misplaying Men of Iron. That wouldn't be shocking. Um, okay. There's also a withdrawal reaction. C armed, C missile armed, C is the composite bow, uh, chariot units using orderly withdrawal can fire at the unit they're running away from. Okay, so if you're using the orderly withdrawal rules to back away from an enemy, you're allowed to shoot at them as you withdraw with the chariots. However, this is done at uh, two hexes, and you can only do it once per unit that triggers you per orders phase. Okay. Uh, all right. Now they talk about shock combat and say, well, it never happened, but... <laughs> 
basically there's no indication of it uh, that they that uh, they can really say is decisive but they gave rules on it anyway fairly significant rules you're basically your great battles of history rules largely um, however here the requirements for shock combat seem different they're certainly different from how I played SPQR uh, so if units move adjacent to an enemy and they're shock capable they must attack and light missile armed stuff is not shock capable they can never institute shock uh, activated shock capable engaged units if you have this engaged marker on you which indicated that you fought a round of combat and neither side withdrew you must attack if you didn't disengage and then non-engaged units uh, that are remaining adjacent to an enemy unit throughout the movement segment and I guess that's possible if other units were fighting may shock but they have to make the tactical quality check the attacker only makes the tactical quality check on these optional shocks that feels different to me I thought both sides almost always had to make a shock unless they were engaged but I may have gotten that really wrong in SBQR okay finally light units can't shock uh, CH2 units are not the chariot 2 two man chariots are not capable of uh, shocking anything all right now they're not capable of shocking CH2 CH3 or CH2 plus RIs um, which is other chariots I'm not sure if they're capable of shocking other things uh, I don't know. And uh, battle wagon units can only shock light infantry. From what I understand, but I haven't looked at the charts carefully, uh, the chariots should suck at shock. Um, if we look, the attacker, well, it's not allowed. Here it's defender superior against infantry. And you'll see the heavier chariots work a little better against anything except the shock infantry. They even work against the heavy infantry, strangely. I'm not sure about that. Um, but then here, when you mix those runners in, they become a little better at shocking. For whatever value that is. Alright. Uh, and then if we look at, like, the infantry shocking the uh, chariots, well, let's, let's look at one of these that had... Uh, the chariot 2 plus RI is attacker superior against BI, but BI is not penalized there. And likewise, well, the chariot 2, that's symmetrical. All right, anyway, such as uh, these are things that we're going to have to kind of see. The first scenario doesn't even have real chariots, it just has battle wagons. Uh, and then you make a check for tactical quality where necessary. The defender has to check. Uh, think if it's not... Hmm. I don't think they have to in an engaged situation. Okay, so first the attacker has to check his tactical quality. Uh, and that I also may have screwed up, uh, but I don't remember in SPQR. I thought they came together. I thought they rolled at the same time. And it doesn't seem to be the case, but I, I may have screwed that up very easily. Uh, I may have screwed up lots of things. I tried not to read the rules too much. Um, okay. So essentially you make a, a die roll and these are d10s. If you pass the tactical quality, you're fine. If you fail it, you take a hit and you will not shock attack. Mm. Um, then all units yeah see I had them attacking anyway as well um, then the units that are not that are engaged but this may be the nature of warfare at this time that these formed units uh, of the classical era would attack or route here these bands might just not hit um, 
Okay, so then the defending unit, if they're not engaged, have to make a check. And again, they can fail, but if they fail, they just take quality hits. Uh, and they could rout if they take enough hits. Then, before the shock actually happens, you make a roll to see if your leader, if you've got one, dies. Now, that's if there's no heroic leaders. In the first scenario, we're going to have heroic leaders. They're a whole different ball of fish. Um, and if your leader is, is injured, you make a check to see if he's killed or wounded. If he's wounded, he takes what? I think the only real effect to being wounded is that you're easier to kill. Oh no, you get a penalty too to your ratings, a one point penalty. But you also will be killed the next time you're wounded automatically. Um, okay, so Clash of Arms is going to determine which table you're on. There are adjustments due to positioning. If you have, I believe it's uh, flank as well. Nope. If you attack directly from a rear hex, one of the two rear hexes, you get an automatic superiority. Otherwise, you have to worry about the shock superiority table. And like in other great battles of history, if you have multiple units attacking or being attacked, you get to kind of choose the best of them to be your lead unit. That's the one that determines positional advantage and that's the one that determines your cl uh, clash of arms and shock superiority. It also is the one that takes the heaviest casualties. Uh, and then uh, you roll on the table and you take damage as listed with the defender in parentheses doubled for a person who's disadvantaged. You've got shifts in here to the column based on terrain, based on the flank position. You have die roll modifiers for uh, the wing commanders or for the overall commander. There's also one for heroic combat. We'll touch on that in a bit. But um, Okay. After both sides take their cohesion hits, if everything routes, this is different to me at least different from how I played it. If everything rounds, it's not the unit that routes, that routes the least that remains. It's the side that routes the most, I think, that has to completely route. I don't know. Anyway, there's a slightly different factor here. There's a numerical advantage. Remember I said there's no size to these units? Well, here, each additional counter gives you a two-column shift in your favor. Uh, let's see how this is worded. Somewhere they've got the special... I don't know. If all units were out, see 9.13. You'd think... That's in the wrong place. It shouldn't be here. It should be in the combat. Um, so, the side who has the greatest discrepancy, who has the unit with the greatest discrepancy between... So, the side that routes the hard... That has a unit that routes the hardest is the side that routes. It's not the strongest unit staying. Um, normal advance after combat. You must if you shock. Uh, Chariots and shock. What do we got here? Not much, except specifying that you don't get to shock on a pass through. And a lot of words saying, eh, hey, you really don't want to do this with chariots in a lot of cases. Um, runner infantry create a different stack for shocking. Now they each have to check their tactical quality separately, which means the chariots might go charging in, or maybe not be able to shock. Um, on their own. Or likewise, the runners might go charging it on their own, and then they fight the battle on their own without their support, which could be a problem. Uh, aggression reaction. 
Okay, now this is a weird concept that the way this is worded, it's, well, gee, almost any kind of unformed units, uh, your skirmishers and stuff, maybe should have had this, but, well, other than like Celts and things like that, I don't think it's really too applicable to most of the SPQR scenarios. Um, so this is Barbarian Infantry and Runner Infantry that are not stacked with a CH2. Uh, if they're attacked by chariot groups, okay, um, either missile fire or charging, you're going to shock combat, then you might have this aggressive reaction. In the case of the barbarian infantry, they automatically must try. Uh, in missile fire. They do not have to against shock. They can take the shock if they wish. For uh, the runner units, it's always up to them. And essentially you roll to see if you fail a tactical quality check. And if you fail, you charge forward and hit them. Um, and that may mean if you're at two hexes, that you actually charge closer that additional hex because you're being shot at and get that in. Um, now, BI that are about to be shock attacked. So this is, that's for missile fire, I think. Yeah, uh, somewhat, they kind of screw up here where this is not bolded and this is. And they should both be the same. Uh, if it's a shock attack on a BI, uh, Barbarian Infantry, or an R, uh, a Runner Infantry being attacked exclusively by CH3 units, the only thing I guess they can do this to, um, they can try to become the attacker, and in this case they have to roll better than, lower than their tactical quality to succeed in making the attack. Uh, a little twisted which way that goes, but, yeah, okay. Um, I think I understand the point behind that. Uh, cohesion, that works as with other, okay, these engaged markers. If you shock and you didn't, neither side broke, and I think there, there doesn't seem to be a post-shock check. Here. There's no, uh, yeah, I'm not in good shape. Do I stay in their role like there is an SPQR? Does, does the formation either reform or break? Uh, that doesn't happen here, but what there is is that you get locked into this engaged status, and then you can't fire, you can't move or change facing unless you disengage, and you must shock when you're activated if you don't disengage. Now, in order to disengage, um, the orders phase that you're suffering or inflicting or whatever you want to say, it's not the right word, um, the orders phase that you're conducting, there we go, you have to declare you're going to try to disengage. And that's all you can try to do. And you make a roll against that leader's capability or initiative rating. Wing leaders, it's the middle number on everything. Uh, initiative for the overall commander. And if you succeed, then you must disengage all your units. And I think, uh, you retreat a hex away, you do not change facing, there's no cost, I don't think there's any kind of fire or anything like that. But if you fail, you have to shock attack with all those units. You're locked in combat. It's a cute, cute system, I think. Uh, anyway, we also have some battle standards, these guys. And this sounds a lot like Men of Iron to me. So, each side starts out in general with a standard. That's where all your units that are retreating in a route go towards. Well, actually, they don't go towards it. They teleport there. Uh, around it, just like they would in a um, Men of Iron type system. Uh, totally different from any GBOH. Okay. And 
Instead, let's see, we'll hit the rally in a moment. Um, so, whenever you route, whenever your tactical quality breaks, you basically make another tactical quality roll against the base TQ, and the unit either disappears from the map, and you mark it off on the route points towards losing, or it teleports back in this kind of disrupted form where it can be rallied. Okay. Uh, if you take any additional hits while you're routed, the opponent comes towards your flag, uh, you're destroyed. You're, you're knocked out of the battle. You flee. Uh, if the standard is captured, the guy who captures it has a couple of uh, possibilities. He can carry it around with him, and then your routed troops run there where they can be butchered, or he can just destroy it, in which case it teleports back. Uh, either way, it teleports back into the owner's hands at, at the uh, uh, refurbish at the end of the turn. Um, ooh, wait. At the end of the next turn versus... Uh, the next activation. So that's a little different. So by holding on to it, you can cause some serious problems. Uh-oh, we need another little break. Alright. Yeah, it's taking forever. Um, what do we got here? Just finished route, I think. Okay, rallying. Rallying in this, again, it's not like most great battles of history. It's the grand, it's more like a men of iron situation with the standards. So the overall commander is allowed to trigger a rally instead of a wing commander's order phase. All right, uh, the wing commander doesn't get to move. Doesn't matter where they are, but the overall commander has to be, I believe, stacked with uh, the standard. And then he rallies any units within three hexes of it. Okay. So that means oh, our other eligible leader. Hmm. Who else is eligible? I suppose that would be by scenario. I don't know. Um, so you roll for each unit. Comparing the die roll to the overall commander's charisma rating. Use the capability rating if a non-OC is eligible to rally. Okay. And if you roll equal to or less than that rating, the unit's rallied. And you put a rally marker on top, just like the others. And it has cohesion hits equal to half its tactical quality. And I think Samurai had something similar to this, actually. Uh, if the die roll's higher, the unit stays routed. Okay. So you don't lose the unit for failing, which is kind of a bonus over the... Uh, SPQR situation. However, you're rolling against your commander, not the unit's quality. And you can do it to all unrouted units. Oh no, wait. When the player chooses to rally all active unrouted units, the units of the command can take other actions, but they're considered out of command, regardless of their command range. Uh, that means they can't move next to an opponent I think they can fire, though. There's a list of different actions you can take when out of command. I suppose we're not in quite as much of a rush. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yes, as I, as I work through this, here we go. Units out of command. Uh, may do one of the following move in or missile. No, that's in command. Out of command may move in or missile fire. However, they cannot move adjacent to an enemy unit. Uh, chariots can't use fire and run or pass throughs. And out of command units cannot recover hits nor attempt to disengage. Okay. Um, and the units that are rallied can't be given any orders until that marker is removed, which is at the end of the reload phase. Um. What's specific about that, that I think again is different, but maybe I was screwing things up, I thought you could ra remove cohesion hits in SPQR from units that were rallied. Uh, you can't do that here. All right. Now, one last little thing, very much like Samurai, heroic combat. It's only in two scenarios. 
Happens to be in the first scenario, which is missing a lot of the chariot rules, uh, but it has this heroic leader's rule. It's also in the Trojan War scenario, which is what I think it was written for, and they threw it into this as kind of a, a sop to make it make sense to have these rules. Anyway, the way this is going to work is there are different kinds of heroes in the game. Uh, some commanders are also heroes, and they'll have the H on them, and the dude that I'm using here is one such with the 3H. On his other side, his non-mounted side, his foot side, he has his heroic ratings, which are these numbers here. And they consist of a combat rating and a stamina rating. The stamina is how many hits he can take before he dies. The combat's going to be his modifier to heroic combat. Heroic combat's not as extreme here as in the samurai era. Um, so, I haven't paid too much attention to the purely heroic roles. Uh, so, for example, I see here that they move when their momentum AM is drawn. Uh, uh, but the commanders themselves, well, let's see. Okay, so all heroes don't check for casualties in missile or shock combat. They can't just be killed by regular men. They can only be killed by uh, another by heroic combat. Um, and when you have shock combat with two leaders hitting, and one of them is heroic, yeah, one of them is a hero. There's a po they they will end up in heroic combat. Another option is a heroic challenge. Uh, so in the shock combat one, it's automatic. In the challenge, um, you can choose not to use the AM, the the uh, the chit draw, uh, including a momentum one, and engage in single heroic combat. Uh, you, instead of activating your units, you select a hero, including a commander who's a hero, and then he can challenge an enemy leader within his movement allowance. He must be on foot in order to do this, but he can dismount to do it. And the target will have to get on foot if he wants to accept it. Uh, you have to have line of sight. You can't pass through an enemy unit to call out your challenge. If the challenge leader accepts the challenge, we'll go to a heroic combat. If he rejects it, he withdraws. Uh, no heroic combat takes place. If he's stacked with a unit... Uh, if he does so, he withdraws. If he's stacked with a unit, he doesn't have to withdraw anywhere. Uh, as per 4.24 or whatever. This is kind of poorly written, but anyway. It doesn't look like there's much cost, if any, to refusing a heroic combat in that case. All right, if it does take place, you basically roll off, add your combat strength, and then, and this is very much like Samurai, um, you take one hit if you rolled lower, and you take more than one hit if you hit that half or third point, uh, a third of the other guy's score. And, well, your stamina is lowered by that amount. It doesn't have any other effects. You're not wounded or anything for the, for the uh, normal wounded effects. And if you have the same number of hits, the combat will automatically continue with an additional die roll. However, if one leader has more hits than the other, he can either continue the fight or withdraw from the fight. And, well, he stays with a unit or has to flee back to one. And the fight will continue until the leader is killed or withdrawn. The leader who is killed or withdrawn loses the combat. 
if you've taken hits equal or greater than your stamina, you're dead. If both people do, they're both dead. If you survive a heroic combat, you'll lose all your hits except one. Now, you'll keep one hit per heroic combat you're involved in that you take any hits in. Uh, so that's kind of a tricky thing that has to be kept track of, but you'll be worn down by a lot of heroic combat. Now, let's leave heroic archers aside for a moment. The winner of a heroic combat, uh, the uh, chit pick, is returned uh, to the cup if you declared the combat. If the non-initiating player wins, the chit pick is expended. That doesn't do much. Uh, if it's part of chakra, and I'm not sure if that's supposed to be part of shock resolution. That looks like there's a B there, heroic combat phase B. I think that's if you declare a heroic combat, you get your chip back. Uh, if you win it as part of a shock, the shock resolution die roll for that activation, all of them, any attacks made, are at two in your favor to the die roll. If the leader withdraws, uh, okay, whether prior to the combat or during a combat, or during a heroic combat phase that's specified by the uh, activation as the, the whole event, uh, you must ignore the next activation marker from that player that's drawn, even if it's drawn on the next turn. It's just considered expended. And, okay, archery. Well, if you kill somebody in archery, it doesn't have any effect other than to kill them. Let's go to archery. That's going to only be in the Trojan scenario. Uh, the Trojans are going to have leaders who have an archery symbol on them. That A there. Um, and they can only use it in a heroic combat phase initiated by the owning player. If you spend a chip to do it, uh, you choose to fire an arrow at a target hero rather than engaging in heroic combat. Yeah, that's like Paris. Uh, you have to be within three hexes, clear line of sight and you need to roll a nine, a natural nine, and you kill the enemy. Uh, the game is won by reaching uh, the route point total, by forcing your opponent to reach the route point total. At the end of a turn, if both people do at the same time, it's whoever uh, goes over by less. And if both sides go over by the same, it's the same. And that's it. Now, like I said, it kind of shook my belief that, gee, maybe I've been playing SPQR completely wrong, but there are things that I'm pretty sure are different that aren't mentioned as such. So I kind of have this, damn, I don't know which way it is, and I don't know if I should look at SPQR, I don't know if I should look at M Men of Iron either, which also seems to have a different... I have a different interpretation of how I think I played that, although I know I made mistakes there as well. Uh, but it seems like they translated some of the rules from there. Really, this is not... And, and there was some warning about this uh, on, on the Geek. Uh, this is not really a clear part of what I'm used to of Great Battles of History. Then again, neither was Samurai. And I feel like... Uh, you know, out of the three that I've played any time recently, everyone has fairly different rules and a fairly different feel to it. I haven't played any of this yet, but I think you kind of know what I mean. And I'm hoping that most of the others, most of the earlier ones, uh, actually feel like Great Battles of History. All right, up this goes. And sorry for how damned long-winded I am.